Hello there, welcome to the European Parliament in Strasbourg for this week's Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now this week we are talking cash, corruption and justice. A new crusade against fraudsters siphoning millions of euros off European funds has just been given the go-ahead. It's a new European Public Prosecutor's Office. Its backers estimate that it could recover 500 million euros or more each year against a cost of 21 million to run it. Just 20 member states though have signed up for now and the EPPO as it's dubbed continues to have certain critics. Well to discuss how it will work and whether it will work I'm joined by two guests today. Firstly Eva Jolie, French Green MEP, former French presidential candidate as well and a long-standing magistrate and prosecutor with a track record in corruption cases. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us and bringing us all your expertise. Uh, joining us for this debate uh, from the Czech Republic, Jan Zaradil, MEP, uh, Chairman of the European Conservatives and Reformists Group in the European Parliament. Uh, you actually voted against uh, the EPPO's creation. Thank you very much for, for joining us then. Uh, I'm yep. sure it'll be a, quite a, a lively discussion. <laughs> uh, before we do get started with that then, our team in Paris has prepared a little explainer of the EPPO for you. The European Public Prosecutor's Office will be based in Luxembourg, where it will be tasked with investigating fraudulent crimes that affect the financial interests of the European Union. This includes VAT fraud, offences affecting the EU budget, corruption and money laundering. The office will be headed by a chief prosecutor and two deputies, who will oversee a team of 20 prosecutors, one per member state. Each country will have delegates who will be able to conduct investigations and bring criminals to justice. Eight EU countries have chosen not to participate in the scheme, including the United Kingdom, Ireland and Denmark, which all carry an exemption clause to matters of justice. The Netherlands, Sweden, Malta, Hungary and Poland have also refused, on grounds that the European Public Prosecutor's Office infringes on national sovereignty. After 20 years of discussions, the European Public Prosecutor's Office is now set to open in 2020. But unlike the original proposal, the office won't rule under a single European law, but rather enhance cooperation between the 20 member states. And in the long term, there's hope to integrate the European Public Prosecutor's Office with the fight against organized crime and terrorism. There we go. So a little bit of an overview for you of uh, what this body is and how it's intended to function. Uh, Eva Jolie, if we come to you first, uh, you've, uh, you've backed the creation of the EPPO. Yes. Is it really going to be the, the Robin Hood of the European Union fighting against the corrupt to give money back to the poor? Or is it another layer of bureaucracy? It's not absolutely not another layer of bureaucracy. I think it's a major step forward. It's the, oh, one of the few good news from Europe this year. Having a European public prosecutor means that for the first time in history, you will be able to conduct an investigation centrally from Brussels simultaneously in France, Italy and in the Czech Republic, for instance. Meaning that you can do uh, telephone tapping, or what you need for the inquiry. You can telephone to the delegated public prosecutor in Italy or in the Czech Republic mm -hmm. to have things done. And before this institution, you have to go through a judicial cooperation mm -hmm. by, le by a letter of request, mm -hmm. which is very, very old fashioned and it's not functioning at all or very, very little. We have, uh, we have institutions that cooperate, but that is not the same thing as being in charge of the inquiry, mm -hmm. deciding what is needed. And the hope is that we will be able to fight VTA fraud. Uh, the public prosecutor is competent when it is more than 10 million mm -hmm. in, um, at stake and it is transnational. You know that the tax fraud are billions in the European Union every year and it is detrimental to the finances of, uh, of our institutions. So I think it's a huge progress. 
So we're talking about uh, saving money, saving resources, saving time and, and getting being, a better and result. Being, and, and also having better results, so, being able to identify, to, uh, to gather proofs, mm -hmm. to prosecute and obtain mm -hmm. judgments. Well, in that case then, Mr Zaradil, uh, you voted against the creation of the EPPO, as we said. Uh, sounds like there are lots of benefits when we listen to Eva Jolie. Uh, why did you vote against? I, I have to say I entirely disagree with that argumentation. I think that we have enough instruments on the national level uh, to fight corruption and fraud. I believe that there is a very good cooperation on the intergovernmental level or amongst individual member states. We have, for instance, Eurojust. We have, for instance, Olaf, which is investigating some uh, suspicious practices. Even in my own country, at this particular moment, Olaf is chasing some suspicious cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end, <laughs> it will be uh, the set of uh, national judiciary system mm -hmm. that will decide about the sentence, about the guilt and about everything. So my feeling is that uh, the uh, motivation for creating this new office was rather ideological. Uh, we can see that whenever any problem appears, that European Parliament and European Commission, first and foremost, are trying to create some new European solution, some new European institution, some new European office. Only 20 of the member states have signed up to this. Yes. Doesn't it rather weaken the EPPO from the get-go? It would have been better if all the countries participated. But as uh, we have countries that don't want to progress in the European construction, as my colleague says, he thinks it is a federal step and I don't want federal steps. You know, the ideology is not on our side, it is here. Mm -hmm. And the huge difference also is that when you have national investigations, very often the power is too close to the investigators mm -hmm. and having a a European prosecutor put that nice distance in the inquiry that will enable to catch the offense. More offenders. neutrality then, is that not an argument? Taking it away from that national level? Uh, uh, that sounds very strange to me because this sounds like that someone doesn't trust national institutions Absolutely. enough, doesn't trust national police, doesn't trust national Well, there justice. are problems with the rule of law in say, certain European member states no, I, that have been noted say, over time. I, I would say that all member countries of the European Union by the law, they have, of course, different constitutional orders. But I believe, and my country probably is one of good examples because, as I said before, there are few Olaf <laughs> investigations going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if they found out anything wrong, then it will be proceeded in a proper way and it will, it will go to judiciary. And uh, if there is any criminal act, uh, it will be sentenced at the end. So You're I very think optimistic because uh, the figures are telling us that out of the inquiries of Olaf, less than half when they find wrongdoings mm -hmm. are being prosecuted. That's the European <laughs> Union's current anti-fraud agency, just for our viewers. Yes. So. Uh, yes. if, when they are if, sending their file mm -hmm. to a member state, the member state is free not to prosecute. So when you have fraud in, uh, in European funds, mm. Italy, for instance, can decide that I don't want to, mm -hmm. to prosecute. Or France, we have had, uh, there are many examples of that. Olaf are sending the file mm -hmm. and the member state is not prosecuted. And we are talking excuse about taxpayers' money. No. People excuse are very concerned me. about where their money is going, aren't they? Excuse Especially me, in the European but, Union. Excuse me, but if Olaf accuses yes. some institution or some individual from any wrongdoing, uh, it is perfectly entitled to do so, but only independent court can mm -hmm. decide mm -hmm. whether the, in the institution or the person is guilty. But the, and the by the way, the cases are not will, reaching the court the same, because it's being stopped at the prosecution level. The same is going to happen under this new uh, uh, European prosecutor because at the end it will be a national independent court that is going to decide whether uh, a criminal act was committed mm -hmm. or not. So I don't see any difference. OK, I think there is a big question here about how much we trust the individual member states uh, on their rule of law. I'd like to bring up a recent case that's had a, a, big, a huge amount of discussion here in Europe and beyond. Uh, the murder of the Maltese journalist uh, Daphne Caruana yes. Galizia. Now, there is an investigation, of course, into the murder. Doesn't the EU, though, have 
more of a responsibility to act on the, on the, the underlying corruption cases that she was investigating over so many years, which are so closely linked to this murder. If there hadn't been such long-standing corruption in Malta, surely uh, this would never have come to this point. I think we have a responsibility. The Commission has a responsibility to find out whether Malta is applying European law, and especially the anti-laundering laws, because Malta has become, they have very many ongoing cases or very many suspicions, mm -hmm. very many informations that did come up in the Panama Papers about people very close to Joseph Muska, and no inquiry has been started. And what we see also from Italy, where the anti-mafia judges are making inquiry into traffic in oil between Liberia and Malta, they are not cooperating. They are not giving judicial cooperation. Because the general problem is that uh, um, the state have borders and uh, the the criminals don't have borders, and this is why the European prosecutor is so important. But our responsibility is really, uh, as we are saying in the PANA report, we have to check that the countries are applying our anti-money laundering laws. When, it, when things like this go against European principles, uh, would you agree with that, Mr. Zaradil? Well, of course, uh, any murder is a criminal act and has to be properly investigated and the punishment must come. But European prosecutor has no jurisdiction in this particular field. The, the crime Not of to murder, investigate the crime itself, but to yes. investigate the, the context within this murder yes, was carried sure, out. Sure. I think that uh, it's a very serious thing and it has to be properly investigated. But at the end, national uh, courts of justice, national uh, jurisdiction will be applied on those who committed the crime. There are calls for the European Commission to investigate corruption in Malta. Is that something that you would support? Well, again, we have institutions like OLAF, we have cooperation under Eurojust, and I believe that it's been working quite well. And again, I can tell you that in my own country, we, we've had several cases mm -hmm. that were properly covered by OLAF, and that definitely will end up in our national courts of justice. So in my feeling, uh, we have enough institutions and enough intergovernmental cooperation and cooperation amongst national states mm -hmm. to catch up those who committed any wrongdoing or any fraudulent practices. We just have a very small amount of time to put the same question to you, Eva Jolie. Uh, should the European Commission investigate corruption in Malta or in any of the other member states where it seems to be a problem? I'm afraid that the, the Commission cannot investigate corruption. Uh, that is not in the treaty. But what they can do is to start infringement proceedings as to non-compliance non with the European laws, mm -hmm. the anti-money laundering laws. We have now, uh, we are on the fifth directive and uh, the Commission could, for instance, make a regulation so that the anti-money laundering rules mm -hmm. are not waiting for implementation, but are automatically implemented in all the member states. It is a such important question. So, uh, and the situation in Malta is terribly preoccupating mm -hmm. because of all the suspicions surrounding this government. Uh, we know from the Panama Papers that uh, a minister has uh, uh, for an account that the wife of the, the Prime Minister has one million dollar given mm -hmm. by Azerbaijan and all there are a lot of very bad events. There is plenty, plenty, of, uh, plenty accusations of coming look, out certainly to look into. Of course. And uh, what we in the Panama Committee yeah. has found out mm -hmm. is that they are not compliant with the anti money laundering laws. There certainly are many, many issues uh, that have come out of this case. Uh, thank you both so much uh, for talking to us here on France 24 about that and, uh, of course, about the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Uh, we're going to move on from our debate uh, to our check on what's factual and what's fake in the latest news being reported about the European Union. Has the free trade deal with Canada put genetically modified salmon on European menus. As of July this year, 
a company called Aquabonti Technologies, has been authorized to sell its genetically modified salmon in Canadian supermarkets. This fish can grow twice as fast as their conventionally farmed cousins, earning them the nickname Frankenfish. On September 21st, a major new trade deal between the EU and Canada, also known as CETA, entered into force. Some people fear that this means genetically modified salmon could soon be sold in European shops too. With or without CETA, GM salmon is not authorized in Europe. No GM product can be sold in Europe without prior approval. Aquabonti Technologies is well aware of that and has been clear that it does not plan to try and sell its GM salmon in Europe. So what about potential fraud? If needed, very strict measures can be taken immediately. For example, all of Brazilian meat consignments are currently checked at the EU border following concerns over meat from Brazil. And that brings us to the end of uh, this programme. Thanks again to both my guests, Yann Azaradil from the Czech Republic and Eva Jolie uh, from France for being with us for Talking Europe. Do stay tuned to France 24.